Hi everyone, we'll be waiting two to three minutes before starting the webinar to accommodate for the rest of the attendees who are in the middle of connecting. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us and thanks for being part of our community. My name is Valen Kolika and uh, I'll be your host for today. A few reminders before starting. If you have issues viewing the stream at any time during this presentation and you're using the web browser version of Teams, just please refresh your browser. And if you're using the desktop app of Teams, you can just exit and rejoin. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and uh, will be shared publicly. We will post the recordings on our community at aka.ms slash security webinars. This is also where you'll find the deck of this webinar. Uh, closed captions are available during the live broadcast. You can enable it by clicking on the CC button located at the lower right corner of your screen. Uh, during this time, please feel free to ask questions at any time by typing them in the live event Q&A window. You can click on the ask question button. Uh, be aware that uh, any questions you post will be publicly visible. However, if you prefer, you can post your question anonymously by checking the box right below where you enter it. Now, we often get many questions on these webinars and we will do our best to respond to all of them in real time. However, in the event if the answer was not provided or if you may have additional questions post this event, please don't hesitate to raise them on our Azure Sentinel forum at aka.ms slash Azure Sentinel community. If you're listening to this after the fact as a recording, that's also a great place to ask a question. We love to hear your feedback on how we can improve these webinars and to do so you can do that at, by logging at aka.ms slash security webinar feedback. Uh, while you're there, please join our community by visiting aka.ms slash security community. This is the best way to ensure you don't miss any future webinars or major announcements. Um, on our community, you can speak directly to our engineering teams that create our security products. You'll be able to influence our product designs and get early access to changes by doing things like participating in private previews, which you can sign up for at aka.ms slash security private preview. And uh, while you're there, you can request features. You can give feedback, review our product roadmaps, and hopefully we'll get there soon where you can also attend in-person events uh, or join webinars like this. 
will believe that the best way to improve our products is by removing any barriers between you and the people that create them. So we hope you'll join us. Today, Roberto will show how we can empower you with the pre-recorded data sets using Azure Sentinel. Roberto Rodriguez is a principal software engineer with our Azure Sentinel team. And uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Roberto. Roberto, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much, man. Um, well, thank you everybody for joining us today. And as Valon said, uh, this is going to be a talk about, you know, how to use pre-recorded data sets and how to use some research on the top of that and also be using for some training or for just any other use cases that you might have, um, you know, where a data set can help you also with Azure Sentinel testing and, and all that. Uh, so let's just go to the next one. There you go. So as well as say, I'm, I'm a principal software engineer for the Mystic R&D team, and I love open source. Uh, there's a lot of projects that I put together uh, for the community out there, and I'm also the founder of the Open Thread Research community as well. And if you want to know more about these open source projects and how everything integrates with, with a lot of the things that I'll be talking about today, just go to the link at the bottom and then you'll be able to see pretty much everything that I've been doing for the past couple of years as well. Um, and and kind of everything connects also. So I like to talk about all these different things because because at the end of the day, it makes sense once you get to the projects and you see how everything is being built. And the agenda for today uh, seems little, but there is actually a lot going on on each uh, specific step. And I'm going to go over some of the basics um, for a threat research methodology, something that actually has worked for me and, and it still works for a lot of things that I do, all the way to how data sets and actually pre-recorded data sets can help you a lot through the journey of your methodology or just doing threat research. And then how we can start now ingesting data into Azure Sentinel and then just some basic data exploration stuff. Um, the main goal in here is to show you how a data set is created and then how to ingest it to Azure Sentinel. And then pretty much it's up to you how you want to use it and, and you know, several use cases that you might have for if you want to have data um, you know, being sent to your stack. And at the end of the day, I'm going to talk about some of the new things that are coming up for a lot of projects that involve these you know, pre-recorded data sets. So I hope you guys uh, like it and you might give us some feedback at the end and see what actually might be cool to do. All right, so starting with the threat research methodology, um, for me, this needs to be always something practical, something that I can just share with somebody and that person can actually replicate it and then at the same time to be modular enough because I want to make sure that I can apply it to any other, for example, you know, platform that I'm working with, such as you know, Windows, if I go to the cloud, then if I'm using Azure, um, it's very important to make it modular and at the same time to, uh, to make it data driven because we want to operationalize this research, and if we don't have any type of tie to our data strata, uh, data collection strategies or the data that we're currently uh, working with, then it's it's not as, as as impactful. It can help you to improve your collection uh, strategy as well, but it needs to be something that you can operationalize as well. So when we talk Roberto, about these methodologies, Roberto, sorry, sorry yeah. to interrupt. If you don't mind just minimizing the, the lower corner to the right, the teams it's showing. I yeah, want yeah. you to take I want you to take the credit for the webinar because people will think that I'm introducing. So definitely. Thank you, man. I, I didn't know that that was showing in the in the thing. All right. So the threat research methodology, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do to start your own journey to start doing you know research. And when you talk about threat research, this is more towards defensive research, but at the end it also involves a lot of the um, trying to understand the adversary or a threat actor threat, uh, you know, tradecraft and, and trying to do some simulations. But this might be different for you, but for me, this is this is kind of like at a high level what it is that I can do the moment I want to start doing something and start investigating like a new technique or a new tool out there. And usually this doesn't have to be you know, clockwise, like follow one step at a time, like go from define your research goal to understand your adversary and so on. This could start as simple as just going to the community out there, the InfoSec community, grabbing some indicators and then jump straight to the analysis of data, right? Here is when you pretty much see a query inside of um, and a specific tweet and then you say, you know what, let me test this in my environment. And that becomes like you're probably part of the research of your day to see if that actually exists. Right. 
So once again, like it doesn't have to be um, in order. You actually can, you know, go around and and you know try to see what actually works for you as well. But at the end of the day, of course, if you want to go deeper into this and not just run a query, then you're going to start doing some of these steps, like going a little bit deeper into the methodology. And here's when you start reading a lot of documentation. You start doing potentially some static dynamic analysis from the basics to advanced. It pretty much up to it's up to you and how deep you want to go. Sometimes you don't have to go as as deep in trying to reverse engineer everything, but that's just you know something that you can do as well. And then of course you got uh, you have to get to the adversary simulation piece because you have to have a proof of concept, something that you can test and also help you validate, right? And of course you know we want to do this as as one of the first steps as well. Um, and to me, here is when you start getting stuck a little bit because not everybody is an expert on trying to simulate something on your own, trying to build your own proof of concept. Sometimes a lot of blog posts only give you code and you have to compile it yourself. So there is a lot of a lot of steps that at the end of the day you can actually get stuck in here. And this happened to me a lot before. Uh, it will still happens right now, but happened a lot, a lot before because I just didn't know how to do certain things that would allow me to, you know, to execute my simulations and things like that. And the problem here is that when you get stuck in the first step, you don't realize that there is like so much to do until you can actually operationalize something or share something with the community or simply just document your findings. And, and the whole process is it's definitely lengthy. Like there's a lot of stuff that you have to do. And once again, this is high level and I'm pretty sure you guys have your own, but this is something that actually comes to my mind when somebody tell me what it is that you do in each step. And I just document in a few, uh, just a few. Uh, just a few words for each um, step up there. And of course, we want to get all the way to the left, right? And to me, it's like here's when you start realizing we need to start collaborating, right? We need to start actually reaching out to people that are not experts, but at least feel more comfortable with some of these steps. But reality also is that not everybody has the budget, not everybody has actually the, the, the people involved in a team that can cover all of it. And this can actually happen to me as well while working uh, with my team, but also working with people in the community. And I met a couple of people that were really good at analyzing data. They were actually good doing some statistical analysis and they knew how to build a lot of rule based detections and all this stuff. And I just you know, knew how to engineer a couple of things and how to simulate things in a faster way. So I started just sharing some of that data with them directly saying, hey, you know what? Don't don't spend you know, too much time on, on, on the simulation piece. Let me take care of that. You know, let me actually spend some time on it and try to use a lot of the tools that I'm building, you know, open source tools, and then you can use it. So that actually helped me as well to work with my brother. He's also in the InfoSec community and he is really good at analyzing data. And so this is definitely you know, for me, like when you start realizing that there are some opportunities to, you know, to improve the whole process. But then I started realizing, you know what? Everybody's doing this. Everybody's doing the same thing. Everybody has their own methodology. Everybody's doing their own team, ex um, team exercises, collaboration. And at the end of the day, if you want to start mapping things to a specific action that happens in your environment, for example, you will start realizing that you start getting similar data sets. Like every time you want to, for example, read a registry, um, if you're doing it directly, for example, using the APIs, you have to get a handle of the object, of the registry object. And then you have to, of course, access it and you have to close the handle and things like that. There is actually similar data. And here's when we start getting into behavior. And to me, it's like everybody's getting to the same pretty much point. Everybody's getting to the point where they're getting this similar behavior, similar events, and they're moving forward towards you know, documentation and validation. So to me, it's like, why don't we start empowering others? Why don't we start actually, every time I work on something, I can start you know, sharing with somebody else. Um, I can start sharing this data to, you know, to other teams. And in this case, you know, to the world, right? Let's try to empower the world with some more data so that they can actually get to this stage where they feel more comfortable with, right? Because not everybody, once again, is going to go through the whole process. Well, some people might like to do the whole process, but there is actually a lot of obstacles that one faces. And it's important to understand where you can actually help, you know, someone in the community. So here's where the project Mordor comes into place. And Mordor is just a repository of pre-recorded data sets. This is something that I worked on for the past couple of years. And this project is just a combination of different JSON files, just you know, data uh, security events that were 
uh, saved in, in JSON format. But all these events were saved after simulating on a specific technique from a threat actor, right, from an adversary, just getting intelligence from the community, or simply just by, you know, going to Twitter and trying to see what everybody's doing and then trying just to generate data sets. That way, if somebody wants to investigate certain things from a research perspective, now they might have some, at, at least some initial indicators of what it is that you can do. And of course, we have, um, what's it called, Windows scenarios the most. We're actually working on some Linux stuff and I have some cloud, but this is still very, um, not too many data sets. And of course, this is you know, part of the roadmap, but there's a lot of Windows stuff. And, and actually, I like that the past couple of webinars, we talked about security events, for example, when offer went over some of those uh, KQL, uh, you know, lab exercises. And it, it's kind of like fits perfectly with this also webinar because if you wanted to test, you know, some of those skills, you can actually get the data that I'm uh, talking about right now and then it start you know, using some of those things that you learn with Offer. The model project has a, a, a website as well. So it's something that you can just go to the bottom, modeldatasets.com, and it's going to give you a way to visualize all the data sets, for, for example, in a table format, and you can see you know, when it was created, so, so, so you know like when to query you know, some of that data, who created it, and also what tools I'm using. That's also very important to me because even though I care a lot about the behavior and the events happening pretty much, it doesn't matter which tool I use. I like to also tag the tool that I'm working with. So that way others, if, if somebody's interested in a specific tool, they can see that some behaviors are technically the same even if you change different tools. And of course it has a um, attack navigator view. So you can see also from a different perspective what data sets you might be interested on. And, and of course, you can see like probably it's not as populated, but each technique might have five or probably two to three different data sets. So that's, that's pretty much what I'm, uh, I'm working on. And how I choose what to work on is basically on what I feel is interesting to me uh, during the week or during the month. <laughs> and, and usually I try to track also what all the researchers out there are doing. And then once I see that there is something that I can simulate right away, read a little bit about it, um, update my configurations, and I can just start sharing that data. And of course, something that you get is also uh, context around what it is that I do uh, uh, in order to generate the data set. So from an adversary or from a threat actor perspective, it's very important also to, to share exactly what, um, uh, what was done. And one of the reasons is because you might use some of that information for to start the analysis of the data. Um, necessarily in, in a real scenario, of course, you won't have that, that uh, initial you know, indicator. But to me, like when it comes down to research, um, you can start from there. Like if you don't know where to start, you can start from there and then you can start building other queries. And at the end of the day, you can actually then leave the initial indicator behind and then you focus more on the behavior that you're trying to to detect at this point. And for example, this one is just lateral movement uh, using WMI uh, Windows uh, Win32 process class and the create method. And this is very interesting. We're not gonna get so deep into this, but at least the basics of this is that a computer or a user authenticates to another box and it's going to pretty much use the WMI to execute something on the target computer. Once this happens, actually the process that's hosting this WMI um, execution is WMI PRVSE, and that's being, of course, spawned as a regular uh, communication from SVC hosts. Like SVC hosts to WMI is pretty usual, right? Happens a lot. Well, some environments it might not, and some of them there's a lot of uh, traffic. But the interesting piece of this is that anything that gets executed under WMI PRVSC on the target um, is going to be part of the same logon session as the uh, user that authenticated over the network. And that's a very interesting um, context because at the end of the day, you can start mapping this to data, right? Now, the reason why I like to share data is because a lot of the people that were doing research on, on this specific, for example, technique uh, using WMI for lateral movement, they were given uh, queries out there in the community, queries that would say, look for WMI spawning something or creating a new process. And, and that was it, right? They were saying if WMI PRVSC is executing a process, then that could be an indicator of a potential lateral movement. 
But to me, it's like, mm, OK, that makes sense. But that also happens. It happens a lot. How can we add context to this? So what I did is I just emulated this uh, or, or uh, simulated. And then um, instead of just giving a query back to the community, um, I just give a whole data set back to the community. And when you do that, you're actually considering events that you might not even think about, uh, thought about. And, and that was the case with this. Um, pretty much if you start using 4624 authentication logs, for example, that are going to be created on the target, and you use also processes being created on the target with the same log on session, you will be able to add that extra context that you need in order to say, OK, this is actually execution over the network and not just a local execution. So that type of context is very, very important. And, and I believe that that's what I like, the concept of sharing data and also sharing data besides just a query. If I share a query, I'm just telling you this is what I found myself. If I'm sharing data, I'm telling you, hey, if you think of something interesting too, let me know because the data set has a lot of other events or so more context. Now, you might be asking yourself, how do we do this? And we're going to get to how to, you know, how to ingest it to Azure Sentinel. But just in case if you're wondering how this actually happens, there is another project that I put together, which once again, everything integrates. It's called Mordor Labs. Um, and pretty much these are just templates that you can deploy environments with. And most of the environments are mapped to specific configurations and specific designs. And most of that is in Azure. And the main goal is to generate data. So um, even the pipeline is set up to the point where you can actually export data out and not just leave it on a SIM. And, 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 and this project uses Azure Resource Manager services. And so pretty much that's just a service that you can use in order to deploy, to manage, destroy resources and things like that in Azure. And I use Azure Resource Manager templates because this allows me to, to actually pack all these configurations in one or a couple of different nested templates. I can just send that to Azure Resource Manager services and that just gets taken care um, you know, for me. So you know, there you have things like this, for example. This is one of the environments that I have in that specific project. And this one simulates um, a small environment. And this is inspired also by the MITRE ATT&CK evaluations. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but that's just a, a service that is provided with the community and at the same time is used to validate um, some of the detections from specific EDR solutions in general. But at the end of the day, they released the whole plan. So why not use that as a you know, basic plan to start, to start building data sets? Um, and at the end of the day, the collection goes as, as this. You know, for the Windows environment, you do have some, um, uh, some security events being sent to a Windows event collector. And then I use just other you know, free stuff in order to send things to Logstash. And then it sends uh, data back to you know to Azure Event Hubs. You must be asking uh, 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 you must be asking yourself like why the Azure Event Hubs, and that's because first I don't have to manage my own uh, servers um, and, and trying to make sure that they're not being overloaded with data being sent directly as the last uh, hop. And then at the same time, um, the Azure the Azure Event Hubs actually they allow you to use other tools such as Kafka Cat which allows you to then produce and consume data, which means that you can push data to Azure um, Event Hubs and you can also consume, you can also retrieve data from Azure Event Hubs. So this is like the, to me, it's one of the easiest ways to collect a bunch of, uh, you know, it's a bunch of security events from a whole environment, not just one computer, for a whole environment. Everything pretty much put together in one location at the end, and I can just download it as the data flows. I can just download it directly to my local computer. So at the end of the day, it will look like something like this when I have a Azure Event Hub actually um, at the end of this pipeline with all this data being sent. And as you can see, like for example, at some point we have like over 30,000, for example, events. Um, that happens when you, of course, uh, um, when all the computers you know, boot up. So at the end of that, there's a lot of data being generated, but then once everything comes down and you're ready for a simulation, then you can see like it just goes down a little bit, you know, more than that. And when we talk about also how to, you know, get data out of Azure Event Hubs, in this case, as I mentioned before, you can use tools such as Kafka Cat. You can probably use some Python scripts, um, but I like this flexibility of having a tool that is also used um, you know, in production to troubleshoot, you know, this type of technology. So once again, producer, consumer mode, it's just a simple concept. You can send data and you can retrieve data as well. 
So one basic example is going to be this uh, query, which um, it actually uses Azure Event Hub as their broker, as their server where you can get data from. And then you just point it to a, let's say, a, a topic um, in this specific Azure Event Hub. And all this gets automated. So that's what I was talking about, the project having templates to do all this for you. And then at the end, it, it points to a, a configuration. And then at the end, it actually sets it in consumer mode. And then you can just start collecting data from the last event that was collected before you start this collection. And of course, one thing to remember is that I have all this also documented in the project itself, which um, you need to have a configuration to make sure that you can connect to, to Azure Event Hubs. So I'm putting this just for reference if you want to take a look at it later, but pretty much everything in the red is the only thing that I changed. So on the top, you see the Azure Event Hub namespace. And then at the bottom, you see the, um, share a key or, or the yeah share primary key that you get also with your Azure Event Hub um, service. And then at the end, I just have a quick um, you know, video of this. Uh, hopefully it plays through the, yeah. So this video is going to be real quick, uh, just a couple seconds. So what it does, um, that on the left, I do have a computer that is uh, compromised. And on the right, I'm initiating a, consum a yeah, consumer mode of Kafka, Kafka Cat. And then you can see how the data is flowing. So that means that all the data is being collected and it's just being shown to my console right now. And on the left is pretty much um, a, a connection that my simulation uh, server um, got already with a victim in my environment. So obviously it's going to generate a lot of a lot of data um, once that connection it's 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 over there. So at the end of the day, for example, if I go back to this scenario where I told you that I was able to provide data, um, I can show you how I did it. And this is just very simple again. So, but in this case, instead of um, instead of sending data to the console, I can actually send data to an uh, to a specific file. In this case, a JSON file. So it's a, it's the same process as before, but at the um, but at the end, you're gonna see how this is not this is not gonna be as verbose. It's gonna send it to a file, and it's gonna just be doing it um, just until I tell it to stop. And of course, I just run a wmake command, which would allow me to replicate just some basic lateral movement technique. And as you can see, like once I get the results back, then I can actually um, just wait a little bit for the data to be sent to my uh, JSON file, and then I can just stop it. So that's how easy uh, it could be. And at the end of the day, when you stop actually collecting the data, you can just do like a basic grep, and then you can see that there is some indicators at least of the user backdoor being added. So this is pretty much the file that was created. So you can at least have an idea that yes, the day some data was collected that was related to some of the context of this specific technique. And at the end of the day, of course, 4720, just a quick quiz, I guess, if anybody wants to <laughs> uh, type it, but 4720 is when a user gets uh, created um, in like a local user, for example, is created. So that's also an indicator to me that the some of the context was captured by the data by the data set that uh, that I created, and as you can see, like this was pretty straightforward, nothing crazy, just starting a collection and then just running a specific simulation. But the work behind all of this, that's what it, it would take. I would say probably a full day or two days just to set up all this manually. But you know, thanks to, to all the simulation that I could do, I'm sorry, automation that I could do with Azure Resource Manager templates, um, I can just get all this ready to go like in 20 minutes, for example. Anyway, so let's go now, let's kind of get into the you know fun part, right? But uh, first I wanted to, to show you exactly how, you know, what everything looks like. So, so you know exactly how a data set is created and what it is that you're actually getting from the repository. Like I am not just opening my computer, running something, copy and pasting my EVTX, and then sharing it with the community. Even uh, the EVTX file is the file that will you know, have the uh, security event logs or any other event logs from Windows, for example. Um, like I wouldn't do that, right? Because that doesn't give me the context either of the technique that I'm trying to share with you. In this case, if it's a lateral movement technique, I need more than one computer. And I need also, if there's authentication going on, um, and of course this is a domain um, environment, then I will also need to get some of the logs from the domain controller. So once again, pretty straightforward in just a few seconds to show you how things work, but in the back end, there is a lot of work. Now, how can you start collecting data now? 
not collecting, sending data to Azure Sentinel now. So there is a few ways that you can do it. If you go to the link at the bottom, there is actually a lot of examples for PowerShell, C Sharp, and Python. And I was able to grab the Python one, and I was able just to create my own proof of concept based on those scripts. So I would highly recommend to take those scripts and then just making your own and probably add a couple of different things like error handling or trying to see how much data is being sent um, because those scripts are used for like one, um, one API request just to send the data. Um, but what if you have a data set that is larger than the limit that you have, you know, when you can use that API? So that's why, you know, definitely encourage you to use your own and, and you're going to also definitely learn a little bit about these APIs. So kind of the end of the day is just like this, just, you know, grab a JSON file that I created before and then use the API to do it. So for that, if you go to the link at the bottom, um, I created this proof of concept and it works, I would say, pretty well. Um, it's not as fast as I would want it to be, right? It's just a proof of concept, but it's still I can actually send, for example, the data set that I created today. Um, as you can see, this, this data set has the um, you know, 2020 September 14th date in there. And as you can see, like all I need to do is you know, run this as Python script, right? Point to the workspace ID, you know, get the share key, and also get the uh, specific name of the pre-recorded or the custom log, I'm sorry, of the custom log table that is going to be created on your workspace, for example, on your log analytics workspace. And then you point to a file and then dash P, this is, this is very important. Let me go back to these options. Dash P in here means that you're going to pack all these messages. So what that means is that if you have, for example, a data set that is, it's a full day and you're collecting every single security event log, Let's say you might have like over, let's say close to 200 um, event IDs, like different uh, unique event IDs. That means that you have like over 200 schemas because each event ID has its own schema, right? So when you do that, you might actually go over the limit of all the custom logs, um, field names that you can have. And that's not fun, right? Because then, then you're missing all these additional probably field names that you want to use. So what I do is I pack all that and at the end of the day, you're going to have a message field which you can play with. So that's kind of like the, to me, like one of the easiest ways, you know, to handle this because otherwise you start getting some messages, um, you know, that you cannot, you know, use the whole data set or something like that. Anyway, and at the end of the day, as you can see, like I added some of the, um, all these bars to tell you where you are, you know, from a megabytes uh, perspectives. And at the end, you can see this one took two minutes and it was only 25 megabytes. So kind of like, you know, think about it when you want to send something that is a couple gigs, it might take, it might take more than two minutes, of course. Um, and at the end of the day, of course, you know, you're going to see this, uh, you know, Azure Sentinel without much data in it, right? You have to wait a little bit. And once you wait, like at least I would say to me, it usually works like five minutes. Some people say in the documentation, wait up to 30 minutes because you're using the API and, and you know, all the stuff. But usually to me, it's like around five to 10 minutes. It's, it's pretty much what I wait. And as you can see, there's like 5,000 events that were sent directly to my Azure Sentinel uh, solution. And this is data that I didn't have. For example, this is data that you can just grab and use and you don't have to go through the whole pipeline simulation, trying to set up a C2 framework, like a command and control framework that you can use to simulate a threat actor. Um, and at the end of the day, you can just, um, for example, do some basic analysis in here such as in this case, something that I love to do all the time is just to see the uh, schemas. And as you can see a little bit, so uh, you have to, uh, the name that I used was uh, pre-recorded underscore CL. And then if I start getting deeper into this uh, specific message, then I will be able to, to see how this is set up. Um, before we do that, I can actually show you a little bit how this is uh, done. Um, so let me just go back to my, where is my, there you go. I think it's this one. There you go. So let me close some of this. And this is, for example, the one that I was talking to you guys about um, that pretty much the data is going to be packed on a message uh, field. And then you have to use you know, some of those techniques that you also might have learned with, uh, you know, with Offers webinar, the uh, KQL series. 
but I'm going to show you just, just a couple of things in a little bit, but just to give you an idea that this is what you have to do, and this is what I encourage everybody you know, else to do when you're working with data that you don't know. Um, try to see what it is that you have, and in this case, you're going to have everything packed into a message field, and then at the end, you can pretty much um, do a you know parse JSON uh, function in order to get all this and start working with those fields, but I'm going to show you that in a little bit. I just wanted to show you you know the schema of this and you know that way you kind of are start getting familiar and all these field names are, are of course you know raw field names so there is not standardization going on in here and from a research perspective it makes sense because you want to make sure that you're working sometimes with the raw fields because most of them are documented and you can just do it on your own um, and if we go back to the presentation let's go to the next uh, scenario so current slide. So this is another uh, pretty straightforward scenario how you can start pushing data to an Azure Sentinel solution. And in this case, what I do is I try to do something similar that I use to collect data. Now I want to push data back. Now I don't just want to retrieve data and then push it to a JSON file. Now I can use a similar setup. Now I can say, hey, um, I have this JSON file. Let me push it to an Azure Event Hub. And then I can have a, for example, a Logstash plugin, which would allow me to connect my hub all the way to my log analytics workspace. And if you're wondering how this could be done, uh, if you go to the link at the bottom, you can see pretty much how all this is done as well. And these are some of the, the you know, configurations that you, you, you'll be able to use. And at the end of the day, um, the command to actually produce data is very similar to consume data, but in this case, at the end, all it changes is dash P for producer, and instead of uh, dash O to tell it where to start collecting data from, you pretty much just say dash L to point to a file, and then that file is going to be sent over um, to your Azure Sentinel solution. So nothing new in here, but at least you have an option uh, how to do this. And oh, and then at the end, um, if you're wondering how this is being uh, set up, because you might tell me I don't have time to do all this, you know, configurations, and you know, I might use just the API because the other thing looks a little hard to do. I'm going to show you how you can actually do it with one click. Um, and in this case, this is the one that I also like a lot. And um, because I show you, for example, a way to push one data set of 21 megabytes just using Python, just plain Python stuff and using the HTTP API data collector. Um, but in this case, what if you want to send, you know, two gigs of data, right? What if you want to send a lot of documents, right? Here's where sometimes I like to use uh, things like, for example, Logstash as a way to um, get data files and then just start sending it back to my log analytics workspace. And so this one right here is very interesting because what I can do is I can collect a bigger data set and then just deploy um, a specific VM with this data set and then just push the data directly to Azure Sentinel. Now, how you can do all this? This is also another open source project. This is called the Azure Sentinel to go project. And um, this is, of course, a little bit out of the, um, just out of the scope of this presentation. But just in case if you're wondering how to do all this in a lab environment, um, I started to document a lot of different scenarios. So if you pretty much click on the custom log pipeline, you will be able to start setting up your custom pipeline just just like the way how um, you know how I was showing you here, like like that one, or you can you know you also do that specific pipeline, and at the end of the day, uh, you'll be able to start connecting to it to uh, send data um, directly. So once you do that, for example, there are just some basic uh, parameters that you have to fill out, such as the specific subscription, how are you going to call your workspace, for example. Um, and you know things like that, your Azure Sentinel solution, how everything is going to be set up. And then at the end, I don't know if you notice at the bottom, but at the bottom it says add some data sets. And in there, there are two options, and one of them is a large data set. And, and you, you know, you see in there the name APT29. And that's because that data set is actually was actually created um, following the emulation plans for the attack evaluations, MITRE attack evaluations uh, services and how they just produce everything for the community as well. So I was able to pretty much uh, run a full campaign rather than just running one command, how I showed you earlier with WMI. I was able to do a full campaign so I have enough data now to not just play with one behavior, but now start actually joining different behaviors and start using it that way to, to improve my, I would say, 
um, you know, context also around certain techniques and not just have one that it's it's good to have one technique to learn about it, but it's also great to be able to connect those techniques with other ones. And of course, here's when you start thinking now, oh, OK, so I can use, you know, KQL and, and start using all these joins and things like that. And exactly that's what you need to do. So when you deploy this uh, scenario, it's very easy. You get a couple of you know, resources being created, as you can see. So it's going to deploy the VM, Azure Sentinel, um, and it's going to deploy also the custom logs pipeline. And at the end, you're going to see once again, like a couple of events being populated. But then after you go for probably, I would say, let's say probably an hour or less than an hour, uh, you will be able to query the data, of course, as it is populated. But if you wait a little bit, that specific scenario, you have to have at least 700,000 um, events. So as you can see, 700,000 events for a fresh Azure Sentinel solution, of course, you know, backing up, uh, you know, backed up by the by the log analytics workspace. Um, it, it's awesome because now I can just, you know, dive into the data rather than trying to simulate a full campaign, trying to read all the emulation plans, and then trying to see if I can even use this for an exercise for my team, for example. And I think that that's the beauty of having data, like populating your environment with you know over 700,000 events, it's pretty cool like to be able to do that. Um, and at the end of the day, once again, this is just part of the attack evals APT29 um, evaluation. So you can read at the bottom, um, that link is gonna show you everything that I did because you know we will go over the, the, you know, the webinar today that we go over every single step, but make sure that you read it and it's a really fun exercise. And I was able to also take some videos for each specific scenario that, that they were running as well. At the end of the day, also you might be asking yourself, where do I start? And I also thought about it and I was like, you know what? Let me just also build something that the community can use to start getting more familiarized with these uh, you know, data sets. So I built these reports. Um, one is a notebook and it's pretty much uh, just a way to provide interactive queries. Some people can start running these queries against the data set interactively through the notebook. But in our, in our scenario right now with, uh, with Azure Sentinel, we can actually use it as a reference because you can start getting into some of these reports like telemetry report that I was able to do and start mapping it back to detection criteria that were defined by MITRE ATT&CK. And if you go to in, in more details into this report, once again, the link is at the bottom and you can go to that right now. You will be able to get also some of these uh, SQL like type of queries. And the reason why I started doing that is because that allows me to, to teach somebody about queries, but then I can translate it to any format that I want. And in this case, I'm working also with other people in the community to translate a lot of things to KQL, which is more powerful in a lot of scenarios, it, you know, has a lot of functionalities, but the basic stuff, I just keep it as SQL like uh, syntax um, and then people can go from there and then just translate it to, you know, to other stuff. So, Basic um, one, for example, uh, just to finish this, um, you know, webinars and also these demos as well, is this APT29 data set. Um, there was a lot of detection criteria, for example, by MITRE that did not cover actually one scenario that I was looking for to start working with. And one of those scenarios was actually lateral movement uh, using new services installation, the installation of new services. No services that you can modify, but actually services that get installed on the computer um, to move laterally. So um, if we just go to my Azure Sentinel solution that has the 783,000. Um, so I put together a few queries in here, so we can just do this real quick. Uh, there it is, safe queries, there you go. OK, so let me just close this, make this bigger so you guys can see it. Um, and, and of course, you know, pretty much what I do all the time, as I said before, is trying to do also see the specific schema. And once again, you're going to see a very short um, right um, schema. Uh, so I just got to change this to, to one in here. Here's when I can start getting into exactly what my data looks like. Uh, once again, all the data sets, all the data sets that you consume from Mordor, um, I would suggest to keep them as packed for your custom logs and pretty much you just have to start, you know, open it up and then you'll be able to get to the raw data and everything is flat also. So you don't have to do a lot of nesting. Uh, so, so this is 
pretty much what I would do. But one of the things that I was trying to do is like trying just to come up with like the specific ways how I can start getting this data out and then start showing it a little bit. Now this one has 700,000 <laughs> um, um, events and I was testing it with you before with, with a couple of thousands as well. So um, hopefully this one gets me something right away, but <laughs> uh, so let me just push this down right here. There it is. Uh, yep. Yeah, so I was trying to, to do a uh, count also for the specific event that it is. Uh, well, the ones that I have the most data uh, from. And it makes sense a little bit to have a lot of the networking uh, data because there was a lot of things happening, a couple of different reverse shells going on all the time. And there was a lot of beaconing as well. And there was also a lot of PowerShell involved, uh, especially with scenario number two for the attack evaluations from, Miter attack, you know, from the MITRE attack team. And then at the end, uh, so, so something that I wanted to do, for example, was to see if there was any services installed. And just to kind of see it, um, if everything aligns with also the emulation plans that they had. And there was actually some, some services that were installed in order to create persistence, for example. And I was very interested on in those, but I wanted to see if there was anything that also was not just something that would happen all the time in your environment. You. I've been in environments that, that they had new installed services like all the time. There was, <laughs> there was a, I, I, I guess I saw some features on, on a couple of you know, Windows versions that, or, or, depending, or depending on the applications that they were running, that there was a lot of noise coming from the new services being installed. So that's what to me like this is great, but at the same time, I feel like I wanna add some context. And if I'm talking about lateral movement, um, I can do the similar thing that I can do, something similar that I did with my WMI scenario. So in this case, pretty much what we're doing is we're grabbing the context of a 4697 security event, which is when a new service gets installed, and I'm tr and, 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 and I'm grabbing the logon session context of this specific um, event, and I'm also joining that with a network authentication event. In this case, 4624, logon type three, and I also want to take um, the you know system accounts as being part of this type of behavior, just in case. I, I just wanna make sure that I'm covering a domain user or a regular user accessing my box over the network and, and installing a new service. So what I do is, uh, once again, as you can see, I just you know grab the event ID 4697, and then I make sure that I get the subject logon ID in 4697. That's the field that gets you the logon ID of the user that actually created or installed the service. Okay. And if I go to 4624, I'm actually getting now the logon ID of the user that authenticated to this box. Now, something that you, this is why I also like to work with raw data, but at the same time, of course, a standardization fixes this for you, but it's also good from a research perspective to understand the data that you're working with. And in this case, as you can see, the subject logon ID in 4697 is pretty much the, once again, the user that performed the action, the main action, which is the service being installed. And then 4624, the target logon ID is the logon ID of the user that actually authenticated. Now, for those of you that know about 4624, <laughs> that changes a lot when you move from logon type three, from logon type two, from logon type 11. Uh, so you have to be careful, but I said, you know, have to be careful about that, but you also have to know about your data. And of course you have to document it. That's, that's one of the, I would say most effective ways to go about research like this. You have to be documented and you have to read those, those events in a specific document. Um, I call them data dictionaries, and those definitely help for these type of scenarios. Because in 4624, in this context, uh, the, the subject logon ID is actually always system for logon type three. Most of the time, yes, the computer account or, or, or system. And that's just pretty much telling you, hey, um, somebody authenticated, so take a, uh, take a look at the target logon ID context. That's the person that authenticated. So once I figure that out, then I can just join it. And then, um, Let's just run this real quick. And that will be our last uh, query. And then we jump to a uh, other section. But uh, this is just one thing that you can do with these data sets. And you see how easy it was just from not even simulating anything, um, getting to having you know over 700,000 events 
and then how you can start using that to start working on your KQL skills, um, trying to probably use it. Um, I've seen actually companies using these data sets for interviews as well. So when there is a specific interview, they can say, you know, are you familiar with these type of techniques or tactics from the MITRE ATT&CK framework? They say, yes, I feel more familiar with, let's say, persistence. And then um, you can choose your know, persistence in the Mordo data sets um, you know, website. So at the end of the day, as you can see, uh, the hits that I have are PSXEC. And this is, some of you might say, all right, but this is yeah, PSXEC, we all know about it. Yes, but as you can see, we didn't use the name PSXEC uh, or, or yeah, PSXEC SV for the, for the service being installed. And, and that's the goal at the end. The goal is you're going to start from PSXEC if you want to, because in every single emulation plan that all these data sets come with, you get all the details of what was done. So you can go that, that route if you want to as well. But the goal is how you can then tell your initial query to drop PSXEC or any context of PSXEC and then pretty much focus on the behavior. And this is how I love to learn about KQL. I love to learn about KQL with scenarios that I know are mapped to techniques or campaigns that have been used in the wild. Now, of course, not necessarily the same tools, right, that they were using the whole evaluation plan from attack, but actually the behavior, it's what I want to start working with and start learning from. And the behavior in here is new services being installed with a logon context that it's mapped to a network logon authentication event that happened in the same box. And you can pretty much create that context with this query, for example. And then you can translate this back to your, uh, for example, tables that you might use, like your security event table and all that. Because you might ask yourself, why not we send in this to my tables I already have? And that's because currently the API does not allow you to send data directly to a, a table defined such as security event, right? So in this case, you're working with the custom logs pipeline uh, context of Azure Sentinel, but you still can do research. Like that shouldn't stop you. And you actually learn some, some cool tricks because you're learning how to manage and massage and transform um, data that is not as straight up as just running a, a field name in a Boolean query. So at the end of the day, this context is huge because now I can I can share this with somebody and say, hey, download this data set, run this query, and you will be able to see the context around this technique of lateral movement with via new services being installed. And moving to the last uh, pieces of here, let me just current slide. The roadmap. The roadmap for this is, is going to be interesting. There is a lot of a lot of scenarios that I'm working on. Um, so one of them, I'm prioritizing a lot of the Azure scenarios that I would like to deploy. Um, so the other ones are more also AWS uh, scenarios. And the reason why I'm doing this is because there is uh, uh, you know research also showing how you can bring data from different locations to Azure Sentinel, right? You don't have to just grab everything from Azure. There is also other logs that you know, organizations uh, have as well. So how can you train somebody on, for example, S3 data if you don't have like an S3 bucket set up or an environment to do that, right? So you might spend a lot. I, for example, spend probably close to four days to go back and replicate in a specific scenario with, with AWS um, because I was trying to make sure that everything was being done properly and and that's the beauty of sharing a data set because the person receiving it can jump straight to the data analysis and they can learn as they go because once again i don't give you a data set only i give you the context of the simulation and also the the specific names of computers and ips and all this stuff of course other platforms such as linux and the last one is going to be data data injection so this is going to be an interesting one because unfortunately i cannot replicate um I cannot replicate an organization of hundreds of thousands of, of endpoints. But what I can do is I can actually transform my data set and make it look like as if it was being created in the environment where it is being consumed. So at the end of the day, my data set that comes from a lab can actually look like from your domain. It can have the users that you want, the computer names, IPs that you want, uh, because those are the main things that um, define an organization or a lab environment that domain name, that full qualified you know, domain name of, of a computer, um, the username, everything. Like if you are able to update those fields, you will be able to get your data close, closer to what it will look on your environment. So that way I can just inject, let's say, 
a hundred thousand events, you know, to your data, uh, to your data lake, or to your Azure Sentinel solution. Once they, um, you know, allow also the injection to specific tables, for example, and then um, you will be able to add the context of your organization, like hundreds of thousands of endpoints, or probably ten thousand, or who knows, a couple hundred endpoints. Um, that's what I cannot replicate. Like I cannot replicate the user doing all that. So one of the solutions that I've been working on is that. How can I transform the data, inject it in a format that it will mimic your environment? So at the end of the day, you have this big data set and I'm just injecting the simulation scenario that you want to use. And this is awesome also for environments where you cannot execute uh, something on the endpoint. There are going to be environments where you cannot do anything in it, but at least you can have and show it to somebody what events might be good to start enabling some of these boxes by just sharing a data set that is mapped to a specific technique. And that's the, in my opinion, the, the best way and, and a fun way to, you know, to learn about KQL and also Azure Sentinel. And that's it. That's all for me. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And I think we're opening for questions. We still have a couple minutes, I guess. Amazing, Amazing what, what you can what do you can with the data sets. sets. Thank you so thank much you for much. sharing this information, Roberto. Oh, I'm going to share it. I'm going to share here the poll EV questions that came in. You might want to mute your speaker because I can see here myself. There you go. Thank you. So uh, those are the ones that I copied actually from the from the messenger and uh, folks, please uh, feel free to add to it some more. You can access the link is exposed at the very top also on the on the message box uh, pollev.com slash security webinar. Uh, let's uh, go ahead from top, Roberto, and uh, see if more come in. Yep, so, so I can just answer the first one on top. Yep, yep. from top uh, top down. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, so that would be awesome. I think that the, uh, there is also an integration already coming soon, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, we'll be able to collect all this data also directly to Azure Sentinel, the MDATP stuff, um, all that. Like in a more, I would say, like, flexible, smooth way. And I think that that would allow us to, to also export that data. And of course, it needs to be curated a little bit. It needs, it needs to you know get a lot of the, the things that might be related to my lab, only uh, specific things in there. But yes, that would be amazing. Uh, there is actually a demo Azure Sentinel solution that we use to, to share with, you know, with others and, it, and it's open. So I believe that we can work on an integration later once this is more robust and we can have all that data um, as well. Um, currently, there is only, uh, I would say, like built-in data sets, like, you know, security events and also some like open stuff like Sysmon in there, but that's just because of the nature of how the community is also asking for data sets. But as I build more, as I said before, um, you know, scenarios of cloud also will be a uh, priority as well to start showing all those queries also that we have, like in the Azure Sentinel GitHub repo as well, which is a question number three, I think, uh, no, uh, four. Yeah, so that's yes. Yeah, so it's gonna be um, trying to build data sets that will be used to validate the queries that we have on on, on on the GitHub. Of course, you know there might be a couple of potential constraints when it comes down to how do we set up all this in an environment? Do we use a current probably lab environment that we have and then we get the data out, or do I build something such as Azure you know resource manager templates that would allow me to automate, I would say, most of the infrastructure because I know that you cannot just deploy, let's say, like O365 with a template. Uh, let's see, any plans to make default data set available within Sentinel for training and testing purposes generated? Yeah, yeah, so um, the APT29, it's, uh, it's pretty much out there. I um, mean, anybody can use it for training and testing purposes. Uh, so yeah, you don't have to generate it anymore. And that was the last example that I was uh, talking about, how you can leverage those larger data sets, which once again, you know, do not have just one rule-based detection and it might have more. Um, what else? Besides Sentinel, is this something you can use with Microsoft Defender Evaluation Lab? I have not tested it, but I that's in my to-do list. Um, if there is anything that I can do with, yeah, with the Evaluation Lab, that would be pretty cool. If there is anything that I could build on the top of that, um, it would be awesome. Um, I would love to work with the team doing that and probably can come up with some good data sets. 
Any plans to create a test data for all the Sentinel and GitHub use cases? Yes, as I mentioned before, that's the plan as well. We just have to prioritize some of them, but also know what will be something that would be easy to do like right away and something that might take more planning and more infrastructure and more lab scenarios and all this stuff. Any plans to support Linux? Yes, so if you go to Azure Sentinel to go, the project that I posted also earlier, and it's it's all part of the OTRF organization, which once again is the Open Threat Research um, organization. It's a community-based, community-driven uh, project. And that one has actually already a, a template to collect data from Linux environments, but it's not, I would say, robust enough yet, but it pretty much does everything that I wanted to do so far. Um, but it's not part of Mordor yet, but it, it's definitely on the on the roadmap as well. There is a lot of platforms that uh, definitely will love to work with. So, yes, hopefully that answered the questions. <laughs> Thank you, Roberto. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, so just some reminders before ending the call uh, for our next upcoming uh, not just Sentinel, all up uh, security webinars, please uh, go and register on the link that I had published uh, at aka.ms slash security webinars. And uh, <clears throat> in case we missed, sorry about that, in case we missed to answer your question or if you have any additional questions, you can visit us and post on uh, Azure Sentinel forum at uh, aka.ms slash Azure Sentinel community. Uh, I would like to close this webinar by thanking Roberto for an awesome presentation. Thank you so much, Roberto. And uh, thank you to the rest of the team who helped answering the questions. And uh, most of all, I want to thank all of you for being part of our community and for joining us on these webinars. So we hope to see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.